good afternoon. On behalf of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to very warmly welcome all of you who are joining this uh, important guest lecture today at the SLMA uh, on our invitation. And also I would like to welcome all of you who are joining online uh, today to this uh, guest lecture on lifestyle medicine, the future of chronic disease management. As you all know, Sri Lanka Medical Association is the apex body of all doctors in Sri Lanka. And uh, we have various academic activities that um, that are to promote the practice, good practice of medicine in the country and also influencing policy. This year, our theme is Towards Humane Healthcare, Excellence, Equity and Community. That is, we all know that we are facing a very challenging time in Sri Lanka now, given the serious economic crisis that we are in and also the various... Uh, resulting social problems and health sector is also now constrained with a lot of resource limitations and also we are see seeing the social manifestations which are also uh, ending up in hospitals and we have to deal with all that. So when we look at the health situation in Sri Lanka now, although we used to traditionally look at the um, disease uh, problems or health problems from an epidemiological perspective, classifying them into non-communicable and communicable diseases, we now see that we have to have an integrated approach. That is, different disciplines need to work together. So, Sri Lanka Medical Association, we thrive for excellence and in clinical care, preventive care, and also we see the, the uh, health outcomes uh, becoming much more inequitable. That is, we see these differences in all the uh, disease indices, whether it's uh, infant mortality rate or whether we look at the uh, uh, nutritional uh, status of children and particularly during the last three years, we have seen the impact being worse on the low income groups of this country. So as a professional medical association, which is uh, represented by all doctors in Sri Lanka, all uh, subspecialities and also those who are working in the state sector, non-state sector, private sector, um, so, we see a bigger responsibility to respond to this crisis today. So, guest lectures are a series of lectures where we invite experts who are uh, excelling in different fields to share their knowledge and experience uh, in relation to the current health problems and we look at the future. So, today we have Dr. Samandika Saparamadu, MBBS, IBLM, who is a primary care and lifestyle medicine physician. He graduated from the University of Colombo and was based in Singapore, working in public health care and particularly medical startups. I think it's very special because uh, doctors uh, uh, initiating startups, it's quite rare and it's uh, really encouraging to note uh, Samandika has taken up uh, this area as well. So now he's reading for his MPH at uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. It's good to know because I'm also... A, uh, product of Johns Hopkins, 30 years back, <laughs> 1989. Um, so, um, Dr. Saparamadu is a, a charter member of Sri Lanka uh, Society of Lifestyle Medicine, and I'm also privileged to be uh, a founding member of the, uh, of the uh, uh, society. And also, he's the chair of the Lifestyle Medicine Research Alliance, and he also serves as the... Um, as the president of the Asian Lifestyle Medicine Council and the executive board of the uh, World Lifestyle Medicine Organization. He's a, a researcher as well, and he has been invited as a reviewer for many journals, including Na Nature Scientific Reports, Annals Ma Academy of Medicine in Singapore, and Chaos. His main research interests are chronic disease epidemiology, health policy, health equity, and health promotion. So, on behalf of the Council of Sri Lanka Medical Association, I would like to very warmly welcome uh, Dr. Samandika Saparamadu, and I wish to invite you now to deliver the lecture on lifestyle medicine, the future of chronic disease management. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Vinaya, for, for the lovely introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me today. Uh, our topic today, you can hear me, right? Even I'm away from the, ca from the mic. Right. So uh, our topic here today is uh, about emerging medical discipline. It's called lifestyle medicine. Uh, I hope to walk you through uh, a brief journey around this discipline and raise a few questions regarding the discipline of lifestyle medicine and its applications in an uncommunicable disease management uh, more towards the end of the lecture, so end of the talk. So stay with me and, and relax, uh, sit back and relax. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare, so uh, why don't we straight away get into the topic and talk a little bit about the background and the definitions. So we'll start with what we already know. Uh, I need to say, I don't want to really bore you with a lot of facts and figures that you already know. Everyone knows about chronic diseases, non-communicable diseases, the trends in Sri Lanka and around the world. But just to set the ground and make the story, create the story for this talk, uh, let's go through some of the landmark trials as well as uh, some of the key events in the history. Uh, let's go back to 1950s uh, when Finland had trouble uh, with high mortality rates among men secondary to cardiovascular diseases. So this is Ansel Key's paper from uh, 1958. A few associated risk factors were identified, and high cholesterol levels was one of them. And this problem was particularly, it's profound and, and palpable in North Karelia province in Finland. And it also ex experienced a high rate of smoking and hypertension. So people were accustomed to seeing young men in their 40s, 50s, in the prime of their lives, dying of heart disease. Does it resonate with any one of you? Does it sound somewhat familiar to maybe at least some of you in the audience? It's possible, isn't it? Right. So uh, the interventions were introduced in early 1970s uh, through community programs and addressing individual risk factors through various different approaches, particularly a population strategy and a high risk strategy. So speaking of the latter, it's more about uh, empowering, giving the skills and competencies to the doctors who are dealing with the problems, at the same time creating the infrastructure to make sure that these high-risk individuals are dealt with in a timely manner. And uh, this project had quite impressive results. So if you look at the numbers, within a matter of like 42 years, the, the mortality rate in this particular age group, this particular population, dropped by above 84%. So this is one success story. Even though it took a couple of decades, they had a nice story to tell. Let's uh, go a little forward in the history and uh, 1993 in the, in, the, in the United States. This is uh, McGinney's et al. paper, uh, Actual Causes of Death in 1993. So what they did, they uh, brought about the actual causes of death. In this paper, they examined the causes of death and reclassified them based on the most likely distal causes or the root causes and guess what they found? I'm pretty sure with the hindsight, right now, if I ask you, every one of you will easily say, oh, these are the root causes. It's going to be tobacco, alcohol, uh, poor diet, and physical inactivity. But back in the day, this was a landmark trial. And at the same time, landmark paper, rather. Uh, in the concluding remarks, they said something very interesting. The change can occur. And let's see what happened a few years later, more than a decade later. Uh, when, when Ali Mogdad and colleagues, when they did uh, the same experiment, they ran the same statistics uh, looking at the actual causes of death, what did they find? So these are the leading causes of death, and this is the reclassification of actual causes of death. Surprise, it's the same thing. Again, going back to the same old problems, tobacco, alcohol, uh, poor diet, and physical inactivity. If you look at the numbers, about 40% of all the deaths were attributable to some of these um, uh, 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 mortalities recorded in the last 10 years. So 10 years passed, still no significant progress. So you probably see where I'm going with this, right? And let's take a, a little bit more go in the fo forward in the in the history uh, to 19 2009. This is Earl Ford's paper. They were raising quite interesting questions. So mainly talking about uh, they they proposed that chronic disease decreased as the number of health behaviors increased. And in fact, they went on to say that just presence of just one healthy habit, as opposed to none, decreased the risk in half uh, with an impressive statistically significant hazard ratio of 0.5. Uh, 
So with all these facts and figures, I think you see a kind of a common pattern here. It's a plethora of evidence to say that everything finally boils down to a few attributable, a few, few attributes, few causal links, potential causal links. And if I summarize it to feet, fork, and fingers, this is sound reasonable. So it's all about either smoking cessation, substance use, diet, and physical activity. So feet, fork, fingers. I know this is not really culturally appropriate when you say fork, but then again, if you say feet, fingers, fingers, it doesn't really rhyme well either. So just stick to it for the time being. We'll, we'll come up with something of our own pretty soon. Um, yeah, so one thing that we have figured out is that knowledge isn't always power. So we knew things, and we know things, and we have known these things for decades, and in fact, for about half a century, but still these things continue to get worse in most of the settings in the world. So uh, Dr. David Katz, in, in 2009, uh, he wrote to JAMA, now JAMA Internal Medicine, about why knowing what matters is not what's the matter. So this is, again, even the fact that I'm talking about this is, again, nothing new. This also has been uh, in the books and in the journals for over a decade now. So now uh, this begs the question, uh, and, and with this background, with this backdrop, in early 2000s, in the United States, they started compiling this knowledge and the potential solutions into a discipline. And that was the beginning of lifestyle medicine. But in fact, the, the lifestyle medicine, the name that was coined in uh, late 1980s, but it was formed into a, an organized field, uh, a discipline, a medical discipline, in early 2000s. And in fact, uh, in 2004, the American College of Lifestyle and Medicine was established, and um, many countries around the world right now has taken up the practice and used in their healthcare settings in different ways. We'll get to that later. Uh, and at the same time, uh, medical education, undergraduate and postgraduate medical education has picked it up and, and started introducing them in their curricula around the world. So now this begs the question, what is actually lifestyle medicine? So there are varying definitions, but they're all in some ways converging definitions. It's very important to pay attention to this. Uh, let's go through one by one, uh, but because of the, the time, I think I'd rather stick to one important definition by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. But before that, let me just tell you, Gary Eggers' definition in his two books, he had slightly two different versions. Uh, I have put both of them in here, and at the same time, James Rippies. This is the earliest form of definition from uh, late 1990s in his book, Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, the reason why I picked up a couple of different uh, definitions is because I just wanted to give a picture about how things have changed over time. And when you look at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, the first definition, it is very self-explanatory. It's easy to understand. Just let's go, go together, get, let's, let's take a look at it all to, uh, with everyone. So it's about the use of evidence-based lifestyle medicine approaches, such as blah, 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 blah. So the basic six things about nutrition, physical activity, restorative sleep, uh, mental health, positive psychology, and substance use. In as a primary therapeutic modality for treatment and reversal of non-communicable diseases. And uh, I have highlighted a few things for you to take note. And it's also important to, to figure out how this is an important area, particularly in healthcare settings. In some of the definitions, it's, it's, it's very categorically they mention that. And we are mostly talking about how the healthcare structure needs some changes and how the approach to chronic diseases needs to be changed, in, particularly in primary care settings or first contact care. And if you're interested in knowing a little bit more about the competencies that you need to have uh, as a lifestyle medicine practitioner, there's a good paper by Eliana Liano et al. Uh, that was published as an update to the initial document that was prepared by a, a blue ribbon panel of experts. Uh, this was just published in 2020, 2022. Um, it's available free of charge, open access article from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. It has a long list of things, so I'm not going to go through all of that now. But instead, um, let's start with a part of this teaching. It's about the six pillars. It's not all about it. It's just the six pillars of lifestyle medicine. And ultimately, I need to tell you the overarching principle here is the overarching principle here is about health behavior change. So I already told you about, well, this is about nutrition, physical activity, restorative sleep, uh, avoiding harmful or risky substance use, 
relationships and positive psychology and health, uh, mental health and stress management. When you look at this, uh, let me first of all just give you a couple of questions to think through as we move along with this story. How long does this, a regular doctor-patient consultation last in our setting? And the second thing to think about is how long does it take to get this message across? The message that I just told you in like half a minute. And finally, does it work? I mean, just giving advice or giving health education, is it really going to make any change? Just have a think about it. You don't have to answer. Um, let's go one by one. So let's talk about nutrition for a minute. If you, uh, you may have already come across this term, whole food plant-based diet. So this is basically the overarching principle in, in when it comes to nutrition in lifestyle medicine. We advocate a whole food plant-based diet. In simple terms, it comprises plant-based foods that are minimally processed. Plant-based food that are minimally processed. This is in many ways the overarching principle and not a vegan or vegetarian diet, even though this is a separate uh, discussion, evidence-informed debate that is still ongoing. And in practice, we use many evidence-based based diets. Uh, for example, the portfolio diet for hypercholesterolemia, uh, DASH diet for hypertension, the Nornish diet, CATS diet for, for cardiovascular risks or ischemic heart disease, and uh, Ornish diet, Esselstyn plant-based diet for coronary artery disease, and um, Ornish diet for newly diagnosed localized low medium grade glycine core prostate cancers. And, and one interesting fact is, very recently, the American Cardiology Association, they came up with uh, the idea um, that newly diagnosed grade one primary hypertension actually can be treated with uh, DASH diet alone as a trial uh, without jumping the gun with the pharmaceutical or pharmacological approaches. So this topic is expansive. I don't want to get too much into detail here, but I'd rather highlight some of the points, important ideas, to give you a somewhat of a global picture around the practice of lifestyle medicine. A few things uh, that are regularly done at LM clinics, uh, lifestyle medicine clinics, a thorough dietary assessment using validated tools, um, clinical assessment, including a comprehensive nutrition history, relevant uh, clinical examination, and of course, anthropometric data, including BMI, waist circumference, um, bioelectric impedance analysis, etc. And moreover, uh, like any other medical discipline, uh, any other allopathic practice, we also use uh, biochemical data. Uh, and, and besides, practitioners also should have a good understanding of the scientific basis of the use of smart prescriptions and smart prescription writing and smart goal settings for patients. So SMART stands for uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So in SMART, I would, I would like to emphasize AR. Uh, not because of augmented reality, it's because uh, achievable and realistic are quite important things that we actually get to exercise shared decision-making in, in a clinical practice, in a consultation. So finally, knowledge on food preparation is also very important. And uh, it does not need to go to the extent of culinary medicine all the time, but clinicians need to know how to advise and educate their patients or clients and on food preparation to preserve nutrients uh, to increase consumption of whole foods or to reduce consumption of highly processed food, uh, fatty meals, and full dairy products, and, and minimize the generation of advanced glycation end products. So to achieve the latter, we can actually opt for simple things like minimizing methods like grilling, uh, baking, and frying, and not exceeding the cooking temperature uh, to, to not more than 120 degrees Celsius. So uh, all in all, I love this apartment by Michael Pollan. Uh, it kind of summarizes uh, everything that we have discussed so far. Even though it's a bit of a reductionist approach and, and oversimplifies things, uh, it's a nice thing to remember. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. So next about physical activity. So physical activity is used as a vital sign in our practice, and which means we collect data routinely asking two main questions. How much exercise do you do daily? Or how many days do you exercise every week? And then we record this number in minutes of exercises weekly. Usually we record the intensity too. Speaking of intensity of exercise and types of exercise, and those are also some uh, things to be familiar for a practicing physician, and the METs, the metabolic equivalence of tasks. So this simply means, um, in, in simple terms, uh, this is just one way of calculating your body's energy expenditure. And in simple terms, you can say like sitting or resting person has a MET of one. 
And in, in other words, it's about uh, 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per, per kilogram body weight per minute. Uh, uh, we, can, we can talk about this in, at length at the end if there are any questions. I'll uh, talk about the next thing, which is the physician should know about guidelines and prescriptions too. So when it comes to guidelines, this is not just about knowing or memorizing guidelines. It's, uh, there's a little bit more to it. Why I'm saying this, uh, if you look at the Sri Lankan context, uh, we do have a lot of cultural barriers, enablers, and, and, and a lot of problems that we don't really see coming in a clinical practice that people may not be able to do what they really want to do. So if someone comes and say, uh, one of your patients agree to start with maybe simple walking or jogging around the neighborhood two times a week, a few months later they might come back and say, I'm sorry, I couldn't do it. And, and the actual reasons why they couldn't do it around the gamut. It could be starting from stray dogs, from cat calling, to figuring out what to wear when they run. So I'm not saying that doctors need to have all these answers or solutions in the, in the fingertips in all these scenarios. The good news is oftentimes people do have the answers to their own questions. They, ha they know what to do. They know what not to do. But just that there are some physical or mental barriers why they can't really achieve their full potential. So it's very important that we have the soft skills and the competencies to navigate those discussions intelligently and effectively and efficiently in a healthcare setting. Uh, yeah, and, and with that, uh, let's go, let's take a look at some of the prescriptions. So this is usually using the FITT, the FIT prescriptions, which means the frequency, intensity, the type of exercise, and the time. It's fairly self-explanatory, so let's keep going. We're spending a lot of time on each pillar. Uh, we'll try to quickly get, glance through some of the pillars and then go to a, a more nuanced discussion around uh, lifestyle medicine and NCD management. Sleep health and health, uh, sleep hygiene. Uh, we have spent a lot of time on two pillars, right? So let me say, the scientific fact that the poor sleep quality uh, and duration correlate well with NCD is something probably not really uh, strange to anyone of you. Everyone probably knows this. So a good understanding of circadian and sleep physiology, sleep assessment techniques, sleep hygiene assessment and treatments are unnecessary parts of uh, the physician's toolbox. Therapies such as cognitive behavior therapy, behavioral methods are the first line options for sleep health related issues in LM practice. And one specific area where we strongly discourage medication use, uh, except for mild alternatives like melatonin, is sleep hygiene and sleep medicine. And mental health and stress management. About 70% of primary care provider visits are, are stress and lifestyle related issues. Stress can alter your cardiovascular physiology. Everyone knows this. Like there's a gush of catecholamines in your bloodstream. It's increasing your cardiac contractility, uh, triggering beta-1 receptors, increasing heart rate, cardiac output, blood pressure. And, and, and this, when it's continued for a long period of time, and it's perpetuated for a long period of time, can of course have direct damage as well as indirect damage through different other mechanisms by suppression of the immune system and giving rise to subclinical inflammation. And that's one part of the story. And there's another important part, which is about depression. That is often a comorbidity in chronic non-communicable disease, patients with chronic non-communicable diseases. Uh, the, one of the, the most highly cited areas is, of course, diabetes and cancers. So uh, this is another area that we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis when we are practicing in, a, uh, in primary care anyway. Uh, in a doctor office, the treatment options may include, uh, but of course not limited to, uh, an effective and empathetic patient doctor relationship, a positive psychology brief interventions, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness, and of course, uh, resilience training. Um, the positive psychology. This is an interesting area because if you consider lifestyle medicine as the underdog of the current paradigm of healthcare, uh, positive psychology of is, is the underdog of the underdog. Uh, but the good thing about this is it's fairly inexpensive. Often you can use some of the interventions without spending a cent. It's just a little bit of time. Sometimes you don't even need to spend some extra time. It's just the matter of having the skills and having a simple conversation and, and figuring out what are the problems that the patients are actually experiencing and trying to find simple solutions. Positive psychology uh, has a couple of main areas. Like mainly I want to highlight about micro moments of connection, uh, which is known to lead to longevity and the PERMA model, which uh, incorporates things like the positive psychology, positive emotion, engagement, relationship, meaning, and accomplishments. 
There's more and more evidence to say that these approaches facilitate long-term adherence to healthy behaviors as well as the medication adherence. So it's a win-win situation. It's a win-win situation. The moment you are trying to use some of these principles in your practice, it can help everything else that you're doing in your practice, both the patients and yourself by increasing satisfaction too. And finally, about the tobacco and alcohol use. Everyone knows that tobacco use is the, the single most uh, significant preventable cause of mortality and morbidity. So heavy alcohol use has its own fair share of morbidities, including cancers, uh, hypertension, stroke, unintentional injuries, etc. Here the key takeaway is health behavior change. I'm, I'm quite certain that everyone has come across in their at least in their medical school days, about transtheoretical model of behavior change. So there are various different models, but this is particularly designed for smoking cessation uh, back in the day. And use of this with motivation and interviewing techniques to help patients to, to glide through, to walk uh, through the cycle of change is something we, can, we always use in our practices. At the same time, 5A model in tobacco cessation is another uh, approach that is well adopted by healthcare professionals. It stands for ask, advise, assist, assess, assess, at, assist, and arrange. Finally, um, this is one situation that has overwhelming evidence for the use of pharmaco, uh, pharmacological therapies to help people quit smoking. So that's an important fact, I think, as long as the, the chronic diseases are concerned. So uh, as you already see, uh, you know, even though we're talking about the same thing over and over again, when it comes to prevention, uh, changing someone's lifestyle or bad habits is uh, not easy. This has been the constant problem. So let's talk about how it's actually done in the clinical practice. So let's start with the simple things like vital signs. I'll just talk about the, the evidence-based and, and uh, uh, validated tools like physical activity vital sign, BMI, and audit C for alcohol use. And then, of course, the, the rest of the things are very regular things. Uh, risk factor assessment, uh, physical examination, and uh, interpreting and discussing the laboratory results, establishing a diagnosis, and going on to the treatment. And in treatment, there are a couple of in important things. Uh, this is where the interdisciplinary team-based physician-led approach comes to action interdisciplinary, team-based, physician-led approach. So that's quite important because this is the key phrase in lifestyle medicine tre treatment frameworks. One critical element of this approach is shared medical appointments. This is an evidence-based method of treating patients with similar medical conditions in one to two hour uh, sitting sessions. This improves contact time with the doctor, provides financial model, and improves both patient and physician satisfaction. In addition, health behavior change and shared decision making are inherent elements of this approach. Uh, we will talk more about this later. And, and finally, I just want to touch upon the social prescribing, which is another important aspect, but it requires more manpower for coordination work. So overall, this model, this particular model, the collaborative care model we are talking about, is very much consistent with efficient, productive models in the market, like collaborative care manager model and value-based care. And a little bit more in detail. So we often use the 5A framework. This is not the 5A framework of uh, uh, tobacco cessation. This is the 5A framework for health behavior change. Assess, advise, agree, assist, and arrange. And that with a coach-like approach, as opposed to a doctor-like approach. Right? We don't want like the expert-like approach, where we go and tell people, or oh, you do this, you do that. And, and come back in six weeks or six months or four months. Instead of, instead of that, we're trying to look at it in a more, uh, uh, more humane way, more from the perspective of the patient. Uh, even though there are so many different models for health behavior change, like for uh, population-wide for population and individual behavior changes, uh, I would rather focus on a trans-theoretical model today, uh, and, and this was, as you already know, it was the first design for smoking cessation, but now it's a lot of evidence to say that it's very effective in other healthcare applications too, like when you want to change the diet, physical activity, these are very useful strategies. And this, uh, and also people use, uh, the clinicians use talk therapy, motivational interviewing, 
techniques to walk through the patients, uh, walk, through, walk, walk the patients through the cycle of change. And this, coupled with smart prescriptions and follow-up, is simply the skeleton of the lifestyle medicine practices. So here are some of the key differences between the usual practice or the conventional practice and a, an LM practice. So it's mostly about looking at the whole patient, treating the lifestyle causes, and getting the patient to be an active partner or empowering them to take the responsibility of their own health using a coach-like approach with the long-term objective. And of course, ultimate objective is prevention and reversal of chronic diseases. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, different models. Now we've been talking about the risk factors and how these risk factors are very well going with the lifestyle medicine practice. And now try, let's try to look at existing healthcare models for chronic diseases and then see how, how this is compatible with what we're proposing here. The 2014 framework for the management of uh, population health by Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, this is a very good summary of, uh, of health factors and, and leading to health outcomes. It's very simple and straightforward. In a way, it's a reductionist approach. Someone can complain, uh, you know, a lot of causal links. But uh, if you look at from a more, more uh, a broad perspective, you can see this discusses a lot of layers of uh, possible or potential causa causalities, except for cellular and molecular levels. Uh, it talks about from the societal, from the policies, to uh, the doctor-patient relationship that you see in the clinic. So I just want to highlight a few things. One is health behaviors. When you look at this, so this is about 30%. Its, contribute, its contribution towards health factors is about 30% leading to the health outcomes. Doesn't it sound very familiar to what we discussed just earlier? So everything that, that is pretty much everything, about 80 to 90% of what is covered in this area is what we always keep preaching about. Uh, in a lifestyle medicine practice. And the second of all, about clinical care. Luckily, uh, the quality assurance, quality improvement in healthcare and access to care, uh, equality, uh, health equity, uh, incorporated, have been incorporated into lifestyle medicine since its inception. So these ideas also go very well with the lifestyle medicine practice. And finally, we just need to make sure the social and economic factors, so in other words, the social determinants of health are addressed or are taken care in the process of incorporating a new practice. Because every time, often times we see, whenever a new medical discipline or when a new medical technology is come up, we, instead of bridging the gaps, in, instead of not letting people to fall through the cracks, we tend to widen the gaps, widen the barriers, and, and not letting some of the people, some demographics of our society, to have the access to, to the same quality of care. So just need to be mindful of social determinants of health, and uh, I think that, that, that's pretty much uh, what we can learn from, from the Robertson, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation model. And let me also just touch upon the quadruple aims of healthcare today. So it's initially proposed as the triple aims of healthcare. And later on, the fourth factor was introduced uh, with physician satisfaction. That fourth factor in particular is an inherent part of lifestyle medicine. And in fact, a lot of doctors who actually pick up an LM practice uh, do have concerns about their satisfaction with what they're doing now. And when you look at the other aspects, the population health, uh, reducing cost, and enhancing the patient experience are obviously part of uh, lifestyle medicine practices. You might see, you might ask, all right, you're now talking about, you were talking about increasing your patient contact time, improving the infrastructure, creating more manpower, and now you're talking about reducing cost. Well, that is, that is still possible through long-term, with a long-term objective, when you're investing more money on, on things like the infrastructure and uh, improving health outcomes, reducing hospitalizations, and empowering patients to take the responsibility of their own health in clinical settings reduces uh, the medication consumption too. So ultimately, this actually is known to reduce healthcare cost rather than increasing the costs. Uh, with that, let me also just touch upon uh, uh, health promotion. So any one of you in the audience today coming from either public health or community medicine backgrounds, you might be wondering, all right, uh, you are just talking about health promotion. Well, yes and no. 
In health promotion from the Ottawa Declaration, they, they've been talking about empowering communities, empowering people to take the responsibility of their own health. Yes, that's right, but that's mostly in the communities. The part where, where, where it happens in, through the doctors, through the healthcare professionals, in direct one-on-one -on -one care settings, is, is, is not, it's not something very unique for uh, health promotion models that we have today. So this, in some ways, complements each other. And what I really want to highlight is the fact that the reorientation health services is something that is very much consistent with uh, what we propose here. And after all, uh, here the big question is, so why does it really matter? to us in Sri Lanka, right? So you might be wondering, uh, yeah, we know that works, maybe it works in another country, but does it work in our situation? Or is there any evidence to that? So let's try to see uh, whether we can find any answers. There's, first of all, uh, there's no debate. We all know that NCD trends in Sri Lanka are rising or has been stagnant for a long time now. And this is predominantly a primary care problem in terms of the frequency of visits and the total burden. And uh, at the same time, let's talk about the out-of-pocket expenditure, healthcare expenditure in Sri Lanka. The number of elderly members and preschool children in households strongly predicts the financial burden incurred by out-of-pocket healthcare expenditure in Sri Lanka. And it goes to ridiculous lengths of taking loans, selling assets to cover healthcare expenses. This is all evidence. And this further compounded by a financial crisis, will more certainly lead to a downward spiral, making this worse every year on year. I'm not being an alarmist. I'm just showing some of the facts that we have known for a long time and, and looking at the situation, what's happening right now on the ground. And we'll see the evidence in a few years' time, but this is what's most likely to happen. So how to solve this problem? Well, that's not the focus of the talk today, but in simple terms, I can tell you, I would say taking the focus and money model out of the predominantly pharmaceutical approach to healthcare and coupling it with a model that addresses the root causes of disease and leverage self-efficacy in health behavior change is a step in the right direction. So this is very difficult to, it's very difficult to argue against this because this, this whole model that we're trying to propose is uh, something very much consistent with value-based care, healthcare, quadruple aims, uh, but the bigger question remains, how exactly are we going to do this? How exactly are we going to do this? The incorporation of shared decision making, shared medical appointments, prioritizing health behavior change in primary care and ensuring requisite skills and competencies among healthcare professionals is the best way forward for chronic disease management. It is not that expensive and it's doable. It's not only that, lifestyle medicine also brings a few critical subject areas together for primary care physicians and, and it gives you it, it makes things digestible, and it helps build competencies much easier, particularly among uh, practicing doctors and healthcare professionals, effectively and efficiently. So I'm uh, leaving out social, social prescription here uh, because it often depends on coordination, and, and often it depends on certain tax-funded programs by improving manpower for coordination work. So let's just leave it out for the time being. After all, with all that in mind, we need our own healthcare model, taking cognizance of uh, existing infrastructure, culture, and the economy. The last thing we want to do is to copy and paste a model from another country. And of course, that's what we don't want to do. So, yeah, we, we understand, um, myself and other colleagues who are involved in lifestyle medicine uh, uh, society in Sri Lanka, we all understand that this is not a walk in the park. This is uh, it's a difficult job. And we have few critical barriers. It's mostly about undergraduate and postgraduate training, creating or establishing uh, practice-based evidence, and uh, generating uh, uh, and creating uh, pra uh, evidence-based practices. So this is the kind of a cycle of life, circle of life in our story today. We start with education, get in the practice, build evidence, and this cycle goes on and on. This brings me to the last topic for today, and within this context, how we are do going, uh, what, how, what we are doing in the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine to alleviate some of our problems, or try to see how we can find solutions. So, uh, first off, we have been doing some of the uh, awareness 
raising events uh, through social media platforms. And at the same time, we conduct regular webinars uh, for healthcare professionals by drawing resources from around the world. And uh, at the same time, we also do some corporate trainings and provide opportunities for le uh, learning and knowledge sharing in lifestyle medicine. So uh, one, one thing that we have uh, done so far is the undergraduate training in one of the public medical schools in Sri Lanka. At the same time, we do conduct the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine Certification in Sri Lanka ever since 2000, 2021. And there'll be more and more exams coming from different other countries. And who knows, in a few years' time, Sri Lanka will have its own training programs. And the next uh, is about the adoption of uh, practice. So there is a collaborative framework in Asia and the generation of evidence. So we did establish something called the Lifestyle Medicine Research Alliance, which will be operating, start uh, its operations in January next year. And finally, uh, providing opportunities for local researchers to share knowledge. And a little bit more about uh, the collaboration with the professional and academic bodies. And then this talk is one such example. At the same time, we are working with the NCD unit of the ministry and uh, maintaining relationships with the international organizations, particularly the WLMO, the World Lifestyle Medicine Organization in Geneva, and LMGA, the Lifestyle Medicine Global Alliance, and the Asian Lifestyle Medicine Council. And finally, advocates necessary policy changes, which is something that we are lagging behind, but I think it takes time. So uh, that's the whole drive, ultimately, to reach a point where we can actually make change uh, in the bigger screen. So uh, in the same note, I will also introduce this QR code for the membership of the Sri Lankan Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And uh, some good news about the upcoming conference. So this is on from 5 to 6 October 2023 at the UCFM Tower, uh, just next door, uh, just around the corner, rather. Uh, our conference theme this year is advancing evidence-based practice and practice-based evidence in lifestyle medicine. So we are calling for abstracts. So if you have any interesting stories to share, any abstracts, or if you want to talk at the conference, uh, please write to us. You can scan the QR code to submit your abstracts too, or email us at info at slslm.org.lk. So, yeah, with that, I would um, hand over the platform to Dr. Vinayari Ratna. And if you have any questions, I'm really happy to take any questions uh, from the live audience as well as the online audience. Thank you. Thank you, Samandika. Thank you, Samandika, um, for that very interesting and excellent presentation. Uh, so, we have about 10, 12 minutes. So may I straight away uh, open uh, up for discussion rather than summarizing uh, what he has already spoken. So for comments and questions uh, from the online participants as well. If you raise your hand, we can send the mic. Yeah. Uh, Akhil, can you put to the Zoom uh, chat just to see whether... Any questions, comments? Uh, so let me, let me then uh, uh, ask one uh, uh, question to start. Uh, so about uh, you, you really uh, applied the concepts to the Sri Lankan situation, Sri Lankan healthcare. Uh, system and the need right now and I also coming from a public health background very firmly believe that we need to really adopt a non-pharmaceutical doesn't mean that pharmaceutical you know uh, inputs are not uh, required but I think uh, we have to adopt a, a preventive approach a public health approach to health problems because the the patient load I don't think we can handle if we don't uh, really reduce and really uh, uh, pay more attention to primary prevention and health promotion. So in that context, I think the lifestyle medicine uh, is a very scientific and a very popular model as well, which we can use. So uh, all the resource constraints that we are facing now, even at an individual level, there's a lot that uh, you know people can do. So in a uh, situation where there is a rising uh, tra incidence of uh, uh, NCDs and also the, 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 uh, the, the numbers are also 
not just in in terms of patient numbers but also the uh, amount of uh, personnel required to also uh, care for them uh, how do you see in practical terms now we are forming the society and then working very closely with the relevant uh, uh, units of the health ministry do you see a um, uh, positive uh, response from the institutions to integrate uh, lifestyle medicine that it can become a, a reality very soon in sri lanka it is, it is new right uh, yeah that's right sir so uh, the positive the response has always been very positive uh, that's a matter of fact but the problem is when you actually get to do things uh, still there's we don't have really a good healthcare model even if you want the, the general practitioners or even channeling centers or any other first contact care setting to to give them an opportunity to see how a different practice might work we don't really have a uh, a really good functional model so that's one big barrier and on the other hand when you look at uh, the public health interventions by for example like ncd unit they do have healthy lifestyle centers that was started uh, during the jaika project about 10 years ago and and those are functioning well but then again uh, the objective of those centers are very different and and uh, it's a matter of aligning those interests and making sure that we do have some kind of a concerted effort not to have unnecessary conflicts in addressing the same problem but make sure that we do have a uh, concerted effort everyone is trying to achieve the same thing but in collaboration and uh, with all the stakeholders uh, playing their roles at the same time yeah. right. so the answer to the question is yeah uh, there is always positive response but always we do we are lacking uh, working models for healthcare particularly in primary care thank you any questions uh, can you check whether there are any questions in the chat box please i i can't uh, see anyone raising hands uh, I, i i can't see it from here you can read it out from there if there's any questions yeah so uh, there are a couple of questions yeah uh, is uh, lifestyle medicine postgraduate certificate registered with the pgim uh, no the answer is no it's not registered with pgim it is uh, given by the international board of lifestyle medicine not us uh, because we don't have a degree awarding status uh, obviously and uh, this is given by the international board of lifestyle medicine uh, this is a subsidiary of the american college of lifestyle medicine so, so it's a accredited international yeah right? that's right next question Yes, yeah, so that's all. That's all. Uh, okay. Uh, so until we wait for other questions, a uh, follow-up questions from uh, uh, on the previous question that I asked. In the private sector, there are there is it seems to be more popular than the um, state sector. What's the experience, and have you spoken to some of these uh, physicians who are working on lifestyle medicine in the private sector in Sri Lanka? Yeah, that's right. So. Uh, uh, that's something i mean it's a kind of a recurrent theme every time when there whenever there's a new discipline or or some new technology it is often easily picked up by the private sector especially if it involves a little bit of more investment at the very beginning or need some resources infrastructure and they tend to take it up very easily uh, i agree that there is a lot of lot more enthusiasm in the private sector hospital especially in colombo about well being lifestyle medicine and under various different banners but ultimately as i said earlier and and at the same time your objective for this year in in slma it's very very consistent message uh what we want to avoid is to see a particular demographic uh being always offered the best services we just want to make sure that all strata of the society getting a fair share of their equal access to care because they deserve it they also uh, contribute to to these frameworks through their direct and indirect tax monies uh, so uh they 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 need to get some benefits out of this so i would uh, look at it from a uh, so if you look at japan uh, per every dollar they earn for the government in gdp the people get about 55 cents in return in singapore they get about 42 cents in return and when you look at the sri lankan situation i honestly don't even have the statistics with me but in general it's considered very low so that's a point to think about as taxpayers for all of you uh, it could be the practitioners could be patients clients ultimately we need to find out like what are the ways to reinvest the money that the government gets 
it doesn't mean that government has to chip in in every possible way for all all walks, all all sorts of things that we have to deal on a daily basis in life but we need to make sure that they do invest the money in in things that really have good returns so this particular problem that we face for many years in in it, let it be primary care uh, primary prevention secondary prevention whichever it is these are really good investment opportunities for uh, for for public funds so that's where we need to tap on and that's where the public discourse should be aimed at uh, in terms of changing the policies uh, for for many years and also it, it it should be portrayed as a concept that can be practiced by any individual or a group or a community you know yeah. i mean even a workplace i think these concepts can be promoted so that it doesn't have to be always uh, delivered through the formal healthcare system as such but the healthcare system itself is facilitating uh, and also the primary healthcare that you referred to the the healthy lifestyle centers uh, i think the primary healthcare system strengthening project is very much mm -hmm. now uh, you know uh, trying to uh, ad, uh, mainstream this this model where you know people can uh, uh, go for checkups and things like that uh, and reduce the uh, the, the uh, bypassing of the smaller uh, facilities to bigger hospitals and uh, i think uh, uh, there these are exciting time i see a lot of opportunity though there's a crisis in the uh, in the country any other uh, questions we have one or two minutes please yeah uh, thank you for the very uh, informative and interesting lecture uh, we know that uh, this uh, uh, lifestyle medicine is a new entity in sri lanka but in other countries where it has been in practice how does it happen? Is it separate practitioners, or is it like uh, uh, several people from different uh, specialties working together? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. As I said earlier, it's about a multi multidisciplinary team-based physician-led approach. So oftentimes we see, if you look at individual practices, it can happen in both ways. Sometimes there are practices in hospitals, in their outpatient settings, and in, in private practices. And uh, one physician, with, uh, with supporting staff, including you know, the physician assistants and nutritionists, uh, sometimes health education people, and of course a nurse oftentimes. And the current trend for the last few years has been mostly about health coaches. So a physician with a health coach and a couple of other ancillary staff to help them out. So that's the usual care model that happens in particular in the US, Australia, and if I'm not wrong, in the UK as well. Yeah. So uh, it's not about like a bunch of doctors from cardiology, uh, uh, maybe oncology, and various different other, other aspects working together. It's just one physician with the necessary tools. If they have gone through the practice, of course, they would know how to address different issues uh, with the healthcare team. So if it's one doctor, it could be with uh, 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 one health coach, uh, a nurse clinician, and administrative staff. And that should be more than enough, uh, particularly in a setting like Sri Lanka, it should be more than enough uh, to, uh, to address the issues. Yeah. I'm not really sure whether I under, uh, answered the question. Yeah, all right. Any other questions online? No, no? Mike in the mic. Uh, so two more questions are there. Uh, does lifestyle medicine services extend service to the pediatric age group as well? Pediatric, pediatric age group. All right. So uh, uh, it is not a widely discussed topic at the moment, to be honest. Uh, but childhood obesity and uh, extremes of overnutrition and malnutrition has been a problem in Sri Lanka for a very long time. And uh, uh, so I would say it can easily be incorporated, but we'll have to do an, uh, with, a, with, a, with a nuanced approach, a step by step. So best thing is to focus on uh, the productive age group at the very beginning and then eventually expanding it to other areas like including the pediatric groups because pediatric groups approaching them uh, will need a set of special skills and, and a separate knowledge base as well. We can't really consider the, the pediatric population as small adults. So for the same reasons I think it's good to focus on the, the, the workforce in the beginning and then eventually expand to incorporate the other areas. So the answer to the question is at the moment no, no uh, direct inclusion of uh, uh, pediatric population. I think for one reason is in Sri Lanka itself we do have an extensive history over 100 years of uh, uh, school-based health health programs, so they are running very well. Uh, so that's probably that's probably not the main focus right now. Yeah, but 
can't can't really say wrong if someone argues that it needs to be incorporated. Thank you. And the last question is: What are the basic requirements to enroll uh, lifestyle medicine postgrad uh, certificate course? So at the moment, it's uh, it's about having a practice in license in Sri Lanka and a primary medical qualification, and that is for the physician certification. And for other healthcare uh, professionals, there's another pathway. But that's a separate one. I think it's best to you you write to the SLSLM and figure out whether you are eligible or not. But for doctors, yeah, it's about primary medical qualification and uh, practicing license with SLMC. Thank you. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude this session. And I would like to uh, 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 extend a token of appreciation to Dr. Saparamadu on behalf of the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. So I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Saparamad for that excellent uh, presentation and all of you who have uh, taken the trouble to participate in this discussion and also those, who, those of you who have joined online. So uh, you are welcome again to join the sessions of SLMA and if you are not a member of uh, SLMA, please get the membership. If you are students, you can still get the membership. You can get the life membership or the uh, annual membership from SLMA. A uh, lot of events are planned, including our uh, international 136th International uh, Medical Congress, uh, which is scheduled to start on the 25th of uh, July and will be there till 28th. So all of you are uh, invited to attend uh, sessions which are of different categories under, under the main theme. Uh, and uh, you'll uh, learn a lot. And also, we can contribute a lot as well. So thank you very much and have a good day.